<laughs> do you want me to count you in? And then, and then and then we do the thing with the guitar and we all start. Is that how it works? <laughs> Brunswick Archaeology Podcast, featuring hosts Gabe Ryan and Ken Holyoke. Welcome back to the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast. I'm Gabe Reinick in Fredericton, New Brunswick, and I'm joined as I am every fortnight by Ken Holyoke in Lethbridge, Alberta. How are you, Ken? Very best. I uh, I have submitted marks. I've completed my first year as a university professor, and it, the Fantastic. sun is shining. The, the sun is shining here, down. too. The wind has died down. It was uh, it was shaking the house last night. It was well over 100 kilometer hour winds, I think. But the wind didn't ever die down in Lethbridge. I it thought does. that was part of its charm. No, it, it does die down. It's just when it picks up, it's, uh, you know, you got to be, you got to be aware. That's yeah, yeah. It, it just, just, just to let the bugs in once in a while. There's quite literally tumbleweed here. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. You should get stuck. Get stuck like... in your car sometimes. That's a, oh, yeah? Huh. Know. And well, that that must be a real thrill. <laughs> Walk out and uh, you know what happened? That's a tumbleweed. Fantastic. Um, our sponsor this week is the Association of Professional Archaeologists of New Brunswick. Um, they don't have a website, but they will again someday. <laughs> and uh, if you're listening to this, Trevor, uh, we should have a board meeting and probably figure that out. Send some money to somebody. It was really weird. There was somebody here from. Uh, from the GoDaddy web hosting thing uh, with a leather jacket and a baseball bat in front of my door, but I, I just ran, and uh, and it's it's been okay so far. We assume that'll be back. Um, I believe we have a little bit of a programming note, Ken, which is that we're going to be on a bit of a strange schedule, because I think there's going to be a special episode between this episode and our next episode. Is that right? Cor- that is correct, yeah. So I'm going to pull up a calendar here so that I don't confuse people. Uh, I also have to change our our recurring notification on this meeting but so next week we are at the canadian the 55th annual canadian archaeology association meetings in member two nova scotia uh and we'll be doing a similar on-site show uh where we're going to be interviewing some of our friends and colleagues um and uh that will probably go up sometime um next weekend i don't think it'll be up on the fifth but uh it may be up by the seventh um, and, uh, then we are going to, uh, skip the week of the 8th to the 12th of May. And then our next episode, so our next, um, uh, fortnightly episode will actually be, a uh, a, a fortnightly plus a demi fortnight. Uh, so the May 18th will be the next recording of uh, regular scheduling. And then we'll be back to our fortnightly schedule from there. Great. Um, and, uh, so we still, as as the listener uh, has probably noticed from our introduction, that we still don't have a name for this podcast, which is, as I said, the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast. And um, if the listener were to suggest a name this week that will win the prize I'm about to announce, where would they send that name, Ken? New Brunswick Archaeology at gmail.com. Excellent. And we have a, a really exciting uh, prize for the listener this week, and that is that uh, Ken and I are going to be going to the Cannes Film Festival on May 18th for the premiere, the premiere, <laughs> the world premiere of Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Oh, does that You're, come out this spring? It certainly does, Ken, and, oh. uh, and it's it's opening at Cannes, and then I believe can be seen uh, in the United States in, uh, in June, and this trip will include three nights at the International Carlton. We'll leave and return from the Fredericton International Airport in a fully restored, yes, fully restored, D-138 rigid airship with a layover in Gander, Newfoundland. But that's not all. Dinner at La Palma d'Or, cruising the Riviera in the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast. Uh, well, the, the boat won't be named that anymore because it will have been renamed, so this will be a little bit complicated. Uh, 1947, 22 foot, that's .03 furlongs for our international audience. 1947, Shepard runabout speedboat, French 75 cocktails, and all of the other luxuries can has to offer. So don't hesitate, listener, and send in those uh, suggestions for this week. And Ken, again, where would the um, the aspiring the aspiring jet setter or should or blimp setter, I guess uh, that sounds uh, that sounds like it involves carbs. Where where, where would the aspiring uh, Ken film attendee uh, send in that new nomination? 
Uh, New Brunswick Archaeology, all one word, and that's archaeology, A-R-C-H-A-E-O-L-O-G-Y. So we, we spell it in the continental uh, favor uh, as opposed to the uh, Americanized dropping the extra E. What is that called again? The A-E. There's a name for that, isn't there? Oh, I, I don't know. I think there's uh, like it's, it, you know, it's like a, like a umlaut or, you know, there's like a term for the A-E. But uh, uh, I, I'll take your word for it. With, with the, well, maybe someone could, could write in and tell us. Yeah. The linguistic like, we, we haven't gotten any, we haven't gotten any user email in the counties yet. So uh, um, we'll have to, we might have to do our own research on that one. Oh, we may, but we do have some user uh, email. I understand this week, Ken. We do. And, uh, and actually we have three user emails this week. Um, three actually legitimate user emails, uh, uh, and then the usual podcorn invites. Um, and so uh, the first of these is from Monica, um, and she says, good morning. Uh, I don't think the podcast needs a new name, but if you want to change it, my submission would be between a rock and a herring place. I forget if you guys said Ken grew up in New Brunswick. I did. In case you don't know, herrings is a nickname for New Brunswickers, and I actually did not know that. Uh, having didn't know that either. New Brunswick for almost my whole life, I did not know. I found out found you guys a few days ago after your first episode. I was born and raised near the Belle Isle Bay, now transplanted to the San Francisco area. I've said in the past, had I known what archaeology was, I might have studied it, but I had no idea there was such a field before starting university where I entered the Department of Bi Biology. I enjoy your content as well as learning about all the important archaeological significance of local place names. For example, on the episode I listened to yesterday, you were talking about Chert and Henderson Settlement, and I was like, I know where Henderson Settlement is. Keep up the great work, Monica. So thank you, Monica. That's that's pretty exciting. I wonder how... That's lovely, Monica. Thank you. That might be our only Bay Area listener. Actually, we have... Uh, so I was just going to say we have a hub around Bay, the Bay Area. And I remember we were talking about this. I thought maybe it was because that's where, like, the Google and, and Apple oh, right. offices are. Yes. And they, I think they actually have to listen to the podcast before they approve the episode to go up. So... Well, it's um... good that somebody does. <laughs> <laughs> We also have one from uh, Wesley, uh, and he's saying it's a Hakuna Arata from the Boswell site location. Um, uh -oh. Hi, Ken and Gabe. Uh, great. So we're going to have to play the music maybe um, yeah. uh, before we read this one. It, did, it didn't do the singing. Um, the, it wasn't a singing postcard. Like you opened it up and it just played the Hakuna Arata soundtrack. It, and you, it did you, not. Yeah, yeah. No. Great show so far. It's really good to have uh, an audio version of these topics that are normally spread across numeral textual sources. Quick note about the location of Boswell, which certainly constitutes a Hakuna Arata. Boswell is located in the center of the Annapolis Valley along the Annapolis River, rather than on the north shore of Nova Scotia, only about 150 kilometers off. There's a single locational reference to north that you can cut some slack on the misspoken location. Boswell is overshadowed by the North Mountain, which separates the Annapolis Valley from the inner Bay of Fundy. Additional fun note, although not New Brunswick related, I'm quite sure that Yarmouth Tux Tusket region has, pr has produced transitional archaic material as well. That's right. I'm attaching That's true. a poor quality true. phone image of a base found by a collector in the region that looks transitional archaic to me. And it certainly does, Wesley. So thank you for the image and thank you for the site locational correction. I appreciate yes. that. Thank you very much, Wesley. And and uh, I think the, the listener who's uh, interested in the Boswell site can refer to the show notes from last fortnight. And we've got the deal and uh, deal at all article there from our friend who who actually Facebooked us, our, our friend John Campbell, not Jack Campbell, no matter what hockey <laughs> playoff is going on. <laughs> so thank you also, John, for tolerating. Again, yeah. Again, apologies, John. Thanking, thank you for taking it in humor. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I will uh, uh, endeavor to get you a beverage if you are at the CAAs next week. Um, uh, and, and our frequent writer, uh, Mr. DWB, uh, said uh, that he enjoyed the transitional archaic episode. Um, he's glad that we didn't try to resolve anything about that enig enigmatic time. Um, you're right, Dave. We, we uh, pondered about that, and then we realized that uh, uh, we would hum and haw for probably over an hour and still not be able to say anything. Um, uh, in fact, one of our goals is not to resolve anything. We just uh, <laughs> <laughs> we leave this wide open because it's an open-ended pod. We might have to, you know, who knows? I mean, we're, we've only got podcasts planned out for the next, you know, half year or so. So after that, anything we've closed, we, we can't reopen. So uh, now Dave does suggest that we, we may have uh, uh, touched on a potential paper to think about the broad and narrow point contrast um, as something to explore down the road. And uh, so Dave, uh, why don't we take this offline and uh, next Tuesday, say about 
7 p.m. when Nacho Night starts at the Lunar Rogue, we'll uh, we'll pick up this conversation on uh, on speaking broadly. I think that's a great idea. Um, I mean, we could even we I mean, we could run the mic a little bit at the Rogue, maybe. The uh, uh, we could, but as that'd I, be as, a real experience. I think you should bring the big mic though, because the the little one seems to struggle with uh, with uh, the Calgary Chili's was probably about a couple decibels lower than a Luna Rogue on a Tuesday night. Is the Calgary Chili's, is that a CFL team? Is that the... Uh... <laughs> no. So the Calgary Airport Chili's is famous. In, fa well, in fact, I think there are at least three different Chili's in the Calgary Airport. And as far as I can tell, I've eaten at all three of them. Um... <laughs> and that was just during your last layover. <laughs> well, and <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and it's just because it's the only like palatable food um, that you can get in the airport. Um, and, uh, and it's actually act pretty good, you know. Um, it's you know, it's Texas it's chilies. Yeah, it's chilies. Yeah, they, yeah. Can't go wrong. So, so it's it's you would say it's it's famous within the confines of the Calgary airport. It's not famous outside of the Calgary airport. I think it's famous for anybody that's gone through Calgary, because you. Oh, it's yeah. Essentially, the only place that you can eat, no matter which direction you're going. Yeah, the uh, it must be great, and that you just come in and set your cowboy hat at the door and help yourself to it. <laughs> hang your buckle, <laughs> hang your buckle at the gate, and, and yeah, exactly. Uh, Pull up a stool. So, it's true. So what we're going to talk about this week is uh, we are on to the early maritime woodland period. And this uh, is starts around 3,000 years ago in New Brunswick, ends about 2,200 years ago in New Brunswick. And the listener who maybe is familiar with archaeology in a different region um, in North America will recognize that this is associated with the woodland period, which has got implications in North America. Things like the onset of village life, the uh, beginning of folks starting to grow domestic plants, people starting to use ceramics, uh, burial elaboration around, at least around the Eastern woodlands. And we can even broaden this up, right? And we can say, well, this has a lot, this actually sounds a lot like the Mesolithic to Neolithic transition. And I, I really hope someone sitting somewhere is 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 cozied up to the the turkey archaeology podcast and they're like yeah this transition it's just like the archaic <laughs> woodland transition yeah. in new brunswick you know <laughs> and um when i was at chattel Hoyek, it was uh, pretty much exactly the same thing you know? that's yeah that, that's i think so um and uh, as ken has noted and um that uh, that that ken and i uh, edited a book about this topic about the, this period and um as a result uh, you thought we didn't know what was going on when we talked about the transitional archaic. The surest way to enter to make sure you don't know something in archaeology is to spend a long time editing, you know, 16 papers about it and realizing that you still don't know what's going on. And that's kind of part of the fun. Um, yep. So, so Ken, um, does that does that fit more or less with with your understanding of if we were to think about this period in a really broad, broad way? Yeah, yeah. And, and it's sort of like a, it kind of carries this. Uh, as we talked about in the the sort of opening paper of that book, is that it carries a lot of this what we call taxonomic baggage with it. Basically, it brings a, um, so terminology that we use in archaeology um, kind of constitutes um, uh, uh, can put you in a sort of a time and a place. Woodland terminology was developed primarily for parts of like uh, continental North America, in particular, like the Southwest and the Midwest, where you had this sort of um, uh, uh, archaeologists were kind of envisioning this process that sort of led toward. Um, settled or horticulturalists, right? And so it was this kind of unilinear path that hunter-gatherers were going to take, this forger to farmer transition that was going to happen um, throughout the region. And, and unpackaging that and looking at it in the Atlantic Northeast or in the Maritime Peninsula, and in particular in places like New Brunswick, where you don't have corn, has been something that I think you and I have kind of adopted from our mentors. So, you know, both Dave and Sue, um, Dave Black and Sue Blair have have spent much of their careers kind of like thinking about this idea of what, you know, what the woodland really does mean on the uh, on the East Coast and the Maritimes more generally. And there's a lot of people that have written about this as well. You know, I think I think, uh, you know, our, our paper was really uh, revisiting a conversation that uh, that Kevin Leonard had in yes. <laughs> explicitly woodland or ceramic uh, uh, or what is it woodland or ceramic a theoretical problem theoretical problem the... yeah yeah, the, yeah. Um, it turns out it's not just a theoretical problem it's sometimes it's a practical problem too where it's <laughs> yeah where, the, where we have where we see we see a lot of stuff that's going on in the woodland more broadly uh, throughout um, you know parts of north like uh, you know sort of and throughout the United States and the eastern woodlands more broadly but um, it's a little bit different 
um, as we as we move up into the Maritimes. As, as we've kind of indicated um, throughout the Paleo-Indian and the Archaic period, um, uh, the woodland kind of continues on this 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 motif. And so we might as well just get right into it, I guess. The, the, the listener will note that Ken and I are endeavoring to keep our shows under three hours. But the way we've done that, there's, there's two things. One is that Ken has a pitch clock now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, you know, we, we, we alert him it's, it's, uh, to pitch clock violations. Uh, but the other thing we've done is we've actually just sliced pre-contact Nova Scotia into smaller and smaller increments, you know. So, you know, there may later be one that's like, the middle maritime woodland the first 15 years you know <laughs> but uh but so let's jump right into it the um you'll recall last fortnight we had this transitional archaic period in many ways some of the stuff we're talking about in the transitional archaic kind of foreshadows the maritime woodland period and so um some of this uh there's there start to be a shift really uh, in that period into a maritime woodland way of life ken and i talked a little bit that last episode that we both view this, we are more skeptical about this continuity around this time of period than some of our colleagues are. And this discontinuity, correct? Yes. Did I say we're yeah. skeptical about continuity? Yeah. Oh yeah. No, we're we're continuity enthusiasts, listener. Yes. Um, and uh, <laughs> and uh, the uh, so what are some of the just what's the what's the big what are the big switches can here in new brunswick about when we when we hit the early woodland from the transitional archaic period what do we see uh well you see basically um you see fewer sites in general i, I you know there's sort of what appears to be what you might call a reduction in population based on the number of sites um i will talk about it here in a bit but um it's funny because you have fewer sites but in you know some of the stuff that i've worked on in terms of patterning of, of lithic material, for example, you actually see a greater number of sites with particular types of material, which may speak to something else that's going on. Um, so you get fewer sites, you get a change in um, sort of uh, lithic technological um, uh, practices. So um, you see what uh, uh, Jim Peterson talks about is basically um, uh, sort of you are, there are more, a greater number of sites where um, individuals are basically making um, by faces, so stone tools that have been worked on both um, edges um, for transportation elsewhere. So you see more local production of stuff sort of at, at particular sites, um, and you see those um, particular objects moving out into the landscape. Um, and you also see a continuity in um, the places where people are living. And so I think on the coast, it goes from uh, sort of exposed sites um, uh, looking out at sort of open water, and is it north facing? Yeah, so that's the interesting thing. Uh, Dave Black's done a lot of work on this, where you where you get um, these transitional archaic sites, at least in the Quadi region, are are roughly north facing, whereas woodland period sites tend to be roughly south facing. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah. you have a shift in the places, the actual kind of like areas where people are looking to um, to occupy, um, and then you do get. You get what um, sort of a, a reoccurrence of sort of elaborate burial ceremonialism in some cases, um, which you did not see as much of in the transitional archaic. So it's kind of a return to um, what we were seeing last in the late archaic. And and further confusing the taxonomy, which is just the the word archaeologists use when they talk about naming things. You know <laughs> how they yeah. how they sort up how they sort out the past is that it appears well it's certain that people in New Brunswick are engaged with extra regional patterns of burial ceremonialism. So the way people are burying their dead in New Brunswick and their ritual life in New Brunswick has connections to people throughout the Northeast. And these have all sorts of names, Middlesex, Adena, Meadowood, these various kinds of taxonomic terms that it turns out are completely, are, are often very overlapping they happen in yeah uh in strange orders <laughs> yeah middlesex like it, it was one of the most confusing things to wrap my head around because it seems like it's variously defined by different people but is basically just a sort of a burial component that is coeval with metalwood usually yeah. and separate and kind of looks like adina but yeah right you know <laughs> and yeah and so right right here gabe and i are basically trying to sort out you know this is how i think of it um and and i think that i you know there are some things that are very diagnostic. So there's a, you know, there's an Adena point, right? And these are yes. sort of contracting stemmed, um, uh, sort of 
uh, lanceolate shaped uh, or leaf shaped almost uh, points that uh, that have these very very visible stems on them. You know, meadow wood has these very characteristic blades or or knives basically that look um, very uniform, have kind of triangular shapes. Um, there's also these side notched versions of meadow wood points that are are fairly diagnostic. Um, and then there's also with with Middlesex and Adena you get um, uh, human interments in mounds, um, uh, so earthen structures basically where humans are buried, um, either uh, in cremation burials or sometimes in um, like bundle burials and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's, it's the uh, when uh, I was working on talking with the transition archaic early wooden with Matt Betts for a project once, and we. Um, I was confused. And so uh, in the sense of confusion, I thought it'd be a good idea to get a second opinion. And I, I uh, talked to uh, Jess Robinson, who's the state archeologist in Vermont. And he very helpfully sent his dissertation, which was actually on these topics in Vermont. And he calibrated uh, a zillion radiocarbon dates from the, uh, these early woodland mortuary traditions. And it turned out that we know almost nothing. And the only yeah. thing we thought we knew based on these calibrations, which is that Adina was first, was wrong. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. Based, his 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 kind of interpretation was that all this stuff is happening basically at the same time. Yeah, it's it's massively overlapping. Yeah, and and what's incredible too is we'll talk about later in the show is that there are sort of manifestations of this in eastern New Brunswick, for example, that are happening essentially at the same time as they're happening in the Midwest, which really kind of raises questions, you know, even about like where exactly is this stuff like propagating out of, and and you know like how are like people were probably interacting at a much, uh, much greater frequency than we might imagine, and 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 moving around the landscape, I think, much more rapidly than we give them credit to for these things to be happening, and I mean. On top of all of this, um, this stuff looking like it's happening at the same time, we have this challenge um, about the radio. So you talked about radiocarbon dating. And so one of the things that's happening at around 3000 years ago, in particular between about 3400 and about 2700 years ago, is we reach what is called a plateau in the radiocarbon curve. And uh, what this basically means is that you can have a series of different radiocarbon dates that look, you know, that might fall within that range that all end up calibrating to around the same overlapping time frame, as opposed to being sort of more narrowly defined. So if you're at 3,300 um, radiocarbon years before present and 2,800 radiocarbon years before present, they may calibrate to look like they're actually the same date. And it, I'm, I'm saying that correctly, right? Exactly, yeah. So, yeah. And, and, but we should just catch the listener up that, that when, you, when you run a radiocarbon date, what, you, what you're doing is, is you're sending off something organic and you're getting uh, a statistical estimate of when that thing died. Yeah. The, when they invented this system, you know, the, it's like Willard Libby in 1949, I think, it, you know, invents this. Um, it wasn't as sophisticated as it is now. And so as a result, um, it turns out that there's fluctuations in various things in the atmosphere that mean you need to correct for them, and you and you do that by using some sort of software that lots of very serious scientists uh, update periodically, so that you can get a better statistical estimate of the actual calendar years ago at which something happened. And so basically, it's it's just that during this period, something happens in the atmosphere that when you calibrate them, it basically makes the dates, like Ken said, harder to distinguish, harder to resolve. To periods through time because you've got this kind of flattening if you look at the actual curve that these guys are calibrating it looks flat there rather yeah. than uh up and down which is what you would prefer yeah and in an ideal situation these would be linear right so you'd have um you know your radiocarbon years 3300 radiocarbon years equals 3300 calendar years ago but that's not how it works it's this sort of wiggly line and sometimes those wiggles have like little stopping points in them it's like yeah. when you're running up a hill and you just have to decide you know and you uh you have to pause and, and take in the view halfway up the hill because uh, uh it's impossible to get up the whole thing uh, exactly unless you're, unless you're an avid runner that's yes it. No, that that yeah. that's uh, that's. I think that's exactly what it's like, Ken. I think we will continue yeah. to be known for our uh, for, <laughs> for the sure. schemes and tropes we deploy to help make these topics yeah. understandable to the listener. <laughs> yeah, unpackaging helpful analogies. Uh, that's yes. uh, that's what this show is about. 
Let's yeah, see. yeah, yeah, yeah. As as the listener will know, Ken and I are indeed avid runners. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, so um, we okay. So we're, we're talking a little bit about these uh, similarities in burial practices. The before we jump into that, we should say that one of the other things that happens during this period is the introduction of ceramics. And this is also a whole a, a thing that occurs across the whole region. In the broader Northeast, these types of ceramics are called vinette one pottery. And so that's, those are small pots. They're paddled on the exterior, paddled on the interior. And they're not really decorated in the way that later ceramic vessels are. So they're, they're, pl they're relatively plain looking. Yep. In here in New Brunswick, we use what's called the Peterson Sanger ceramic typology, which um, is set, which divides the maritime woodland period into seven ceramic periods, each of which can be associated with particular decorations that people put on ceramics. And thus yeah. the ceramics can serve as a kind of index fossil to guess or approximate, shouldn't say guess, should I, to approximate yeah. how, how old the site is or how old the particular thing you're yeah. trying to investigate is. And and what Peterson and Sanger did to develop this sequence in either 1991 or 1993, depending upon which version of, um, what's the name of the book? Past and Present, Prehistoric Archaeology in the Maritime Peninsula. It's a, a, the uh, Deal and Blair volume uh, from, uh, depending upon, like I said, uh, 1991 or 1993, which one you have. It actually, um, it was what... released on a radiocarbon plateau. And so <laughs> yeah. we, we, we don't know if it was released in 1991 or 1993. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and, and, and then there's all those pages missing in the, uh, in the uh, bibliography, depending upon which version you have. There's like the, yeah. the S. The S. Um, but uh, 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 I've lost my train of thought now. Um, this is the problem with tangents. Uh, this is. This Peterson is. and Sanger. So, so these ceramic periods, what they did is they aggregated um, a whole bunch of information about ceramics that had been uh, from sites in Maine, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI, uh, parts of Quebec, um, and, they, and they, they favored sites that had radiocarbon dates associated with them, and they developed the CP uh, or ceramic period uh, chronology based on uncalibrated radiocarbon dates. Um, and so, uh, but what they were able to demonstrate is that on a lot of these sites, even at a, you know, just at the radiocarbon date, um, they tend to line up with these, uh, these decoration motifs that Gabe said. Um, but there's also changes to, for example, in the tempering material or the, or what was mixed in with the clay um, that change over time uh, as well. And, and like kind of the, the way that vessels themselves are actually made, whether or not they're coiled or uh, what's the other technique? It's like paddling. Is that, yeah, yeah that's, Vinette is paddled, isn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, but, but these pots are sort of, they're made like they're the kind of um, art class style pots yeah. rather than being made on a wheel and, and that kind yeah. of thing. Vinette, um, they think, they, Vinette, they think might be like, um, like dug into the ground and, and there's like a, uh, sort like, like, um, textile yeah. wrapped around it and then they're kind of molded into a pit is that right i've seen I, that picture remembering that yeah I, i've seen that picture i don't know if that's if that's true yeah. um the uh i mean so maybe the ceramics person may write in and we might we might have we're this we're at the pre hakuna errata stage right now but the <laughs> uh, ken and i realized we we're probably flirting with the potential for hakuna errata yeah. and you have to mix stuff in with the clay because otherwise it'll um the pots will blow up so you need you know Plays uh, plastic materials, but you've got to add some a plastic material to let it have a little flex while you're cooking it. And usually these are like like sands and and that sort of stuff. So you find like grit is what we would call the tempering agent for most of the most of the ceramic period. Yeah, and 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 certainly for all of the Vinette One pots are all grit tempered. Um, this is actually not an entirely uh, intuitive development on the Maritime Peninsula in the early maritime woodland period, or really for any of the woodland period necessarily, because there are all sorts of, it wasn't like people didn't have container technology before 3000 years ago. They almost certainly did. It probably doesn't preserve very well, but uh, in the archeological record, but things like baskets, birch bark containers, you can boil water in these by very effectively by adding hot stones to them. Yeah. Um, and they would be probably light and they would be less fragile. And that's the sort of thing that you 
uh, really expect hunter gatherers would like. So there's actually been um, a fair bit of research on why exactly hunter gatherers use ceramics. Um, and the perhaps related to some of our discussion about these big uh, burial traditions, this sort of ritual activity shared across large areas, um, Karine Tache and her, and her um, uh, co-author Oliver looked at nitrogen and oxygen stable isotopes from the incrustations on pots. So the bits of food that actually burn onto the interior of a pot. And, and they think that the, and also on the lipids, the fats that burn onto the inside of pots. And they think that these vessels may have been used for processing fish, uh, possibly fairly intensively for feasts. So there may be these sort of ritual origins um, of some of this uh, ceramic use in our region, at least in the early woodland period. Yeah. Does that fit with your understanding, Ken? Yeah, yeah. And there, I mean, there's also been some other research, like a, like Skibbo and colleagues in 2016 talked about, you know, they did some residue analysis and it indicated probably plant and animal stewing, not oil processing, but but no aquatic resources. And so, you know, there's there's a kind of, I think it, it's very regionalized, but certainly Tashi and Craig is probably the most relevant to the region we work in just because um, it brought in, I think they brought in pots from the Maritimes too in that study, did they not? I believe they did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So... And, um... The uh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Ken. No, sorry, that pitch clock violation right there. The uh, no, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 as you indicated, um, you've got uh, more fragile technology. Um, you have evidence of feasting, and so this indicates that people are maybe kind of staying in one place for a, a longer period of time, maybe than they had been before. Um, yeah. At least long enough to you know craft a pot, for example, which would probably be a process that would involve you know, um, several hours of, of modeling it and then several hours of letting it dry and then several hours of baking it at a temperature so that it doesn't blow up and shatter um, and then using it, right? So you're, you're, you're uh, planning on staying in one location long enough to build that pot at least um, and uh, probably use it on the first try and then, and then potentially bringing it with you elsewhere. And, but one thing that is also interesting about this period and, uh, you know, Ken, I, I think at this point, Ken, it's safe to say that we've had many major contributions to the um, maritime woodland period archaeology of New Brunswick, but one of them is carrying <laughs> the only pieces of Annette One pottery from the province back from a CAA meeting uh, to, uh, to New Brunswick to return it. I believe we were, we were slipped these at a bar, um, which, if the listener doesn't know, the only thing that, that Ken and I really like to be slipped at bars is other people's credit cards um, <laughs> or, or cash. That's, that's okay, too. Um, and, uh, and, but there's very little actual early woodland material from early woodland ceramic from New Brunswick or from Maine for that point. And so in a returning theme on this uh, podcast, we actually don't have fantastic accessible data about this sort of thing from New Brunswick, but art species work with the Maine Historic Preservation Commission in Maine suggests that only 5% of coastal shell bearing sites in Maine have Vanette One pottery. So um, that's a surprise. Um, you know, some of them have a, have a fair bit of Vanette One pottery, but very few of them do. And there, there may be um, taphonomic, not to be confused with taxonomic reasons for this. There may be preservation issues, uh, most notably coastal erosion that might be uh, preferentially eroding early woodland sites compared to middle and late woodland sites. But it does seem like during this period, there is in fact uh, a lower population than there is in the next period we'll talk about uh, the yeah. the middle woodland so yeah and and where they where you do get um with vanette one ceramics like so gem sake i think there's over 100 sherds of of convincingly vanette one early woodland pottery but almost all of it was found in the plow zone there and so you don't have it even coming from a good context and it's probably all uh um, not in great shape uh being in the plow zone so it's been stirred up quite a bit and so you don't have full vessels or or large pieces that are easy to do studies on basically that's right. We only delivered the contextualized material. Ken and I only work with the work <laughs> yeah. with the yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, and so, but but just like with regard to population, so um, there are ways to model this that involve math and the and and involve looking at the number of radiocarbon dates that archaeologists have gathered for any given period. And the premise is basically that if you imagine an archaeological record that is had a somewhat stable population through time, you would expect that 
archaeologists will sort of over, you know, once you've accumulated enough work that you should have sort of targeted those periods at approximately similar, uh, um, in, a, in approximately, they should have received a, about similar research attention. And as a result, radiocarbon dates should roughly coincide with the rates of population. So periods of bigger population will have relatively more radiocarbon dates than periods of lower population. And listener, you don't need to tell me. I know this all sounds very, very dubious. Um, <laughs> and the people that do this apply all sorts of corrections, uh, and that helps to deal with it. And the other thing about statistics is that as the numbers get bigger, the problems get smaller. And so my understanding is that that factor also helps to deal with some of these things. And there's, and you could say, well, even older stuff, there are all these corrections. So um, the, uh, the way statistics works is somebody sits at a computer and then a miracle occurs. I don't really understand what the miracle is in this case, but you're just going to have to take my word for it, that, that people kind of believe that this works. And that, in addition to the, the sort of impression one would get from the ceramics and from just kind of working in this period, seems to also suggest a population decline um, in the early woodland period. Does that and, fit and with for, your... Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, and for sort of like, uh, uh, you know, Stuart Fidel has this fairly famous article from 2001, what happened in the early woodland, or what happened at three, was it early woodland or what happened at 3000 BP? What happened in the early woodland, I believe, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, and basically, um, he speculates uh, uh, that there, the population decline was maybe caused by um, disease or uh, blights uh, on plants that groups were basically uh, relying on for subsistence, um, that there was uh, some fairly erratic climate change, which we know was going on throughout like parts of the um, uh, uh, Atlantic Northeast as well. Um, and, uh, and he wondered, and he speculated too, that um, part of the reason that we see this elaboration of burial ceremonialism um, in the early woodland was maybe a way that groups were negotiating this crisis, basically, that, you know, something had happened to groups sometime, you know, in that kind of 3300 onwards period or 3400 onwards period that caused a population decline. Um, and, and so these widespread movements focused seemingly on burial ceremonialism and the elaboration of very, you know, fine exotic tools and, and uh, uh, grave inclusions may be a way that people were trying to, you know, negotiate um, uh, uh, crisis in their worlds and, and work through issues through um, veneration of people uh, in the afterlife. And that um, fits somewhat as well, maybe with trying to better understand, or at least to think about the nature of those kinds of interactions. And so like Ken Sassman talked about, you know, considering the the Northeast more broadly said that it might be these, this kind of question of negotiating alliances and boundaries among communities that were more dispersed and um, less integrated. But then, so you're using ritual to kind of pull these smaller groups together. Um, and, you know, maybe in some way, I think there's, there's probably work to be done here too about to what degree people were in addition to joining in with other groups that they may have been resisting them and maintaining their own identities in a kind of very, uh, Graber and Wengrau's recent book, you know, dealing with this sort of thing. Um, we like to encourage the listener to think, think big. Uh, what is it? Think globally, act locally. That's, that's our, that's our archeological <laughs> motto here in New Brunswick. And, um, but we've tended to stress in the early woodland, I think because of burial ceremonialism connections to the South here in New Brunswick, um, there may be, there's some interesting um, artifact similarities with the North. Um, you know, notably that, and I think this one's interesting because it's a Paleo Inuit group. Um, but there seems to be similarities between lithic technology in the early woodland down this way and with uh Paleo Inuit folks. So, um, in particular, Paleo Inuit, not Paleo Indian, yeah, just, Paleo to, just in case, yeah, just in case that wasn't. And so, oh, and sorry. so just to contextualize, Paleo Inuit, Gabe, are uh, uh, can you give us a, a sense of to the listener who the Paleo Inuit are? Sure. Yeah. So, so these are the the ancestors of the contemporary Inuit, um, and the particular group that we're talking about, Grosswater Paleo Inuit, um, is sort of early woodland period Paleo Inuit um, in places like Labrador. Um, and 
we uh we did we should do a rama chert episode actually uh, doing a rama chert episode with no pictures kind of lame but the uh <laughs> but uh but the listener i mean if the listener thinks the lithic material ken works on is nice um they haven't seen rama you know <laughs> just yeah, yeah these exactly. sort of beautiful beautiful lithic materials from labrador is it what's supposed to look like fat on the back of a caribou, right? Yeah, I was just going to say that, that Loring's line is that fat on the on the caribou's back, basically, or, or yeah. sleet on a windshield. I think is the other um, the other uh, term I've heard too. So yeah, I've I've yeah. heard that too. Um, but anyway, so uh, there are these uh, they're called meadowwood box space points. These early woodland points that folks down this way are using, which basically have a kind of at the base they've got a basically a rectangle as the halfling element connected yeah. by a smaller stem and then gets bigger into a rectangle. Um, these look a lot like harpoon end blades, paleo Inuit, um, harpoon end blades. Sorry, I'll not enunciate that more clearly again, paleo Inuit. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they uh, you, you'd think we talk fast enough that we'd be able to get these things done in under two hours, wouldn't you? But, <laughs> but we, we try, we try, listener. Um, and uh, so we've got these potential northern connections as well as these more more southerly ones. And and those so those box base points are kind of interesting. And so um, you know, in in my work looking at like Washington Chert, the stuff from South Central New Brunswick, um, you see in the early woodland actually um, kind of an explosion of of Washington Chert. It's sort of all over the region, right? In places, and in particular, it's sort of in um, the uh, Chippewa-Nettacook uh, Lakes region, so on the, on the Saint Croix River, down into the Passamaquoddy Bay area, um, and in and some places in, in Nova Scotia as well, and down into southwestern Maine. And what you're seeing is that a lot of those um, uh, sites that have Washington Oak Chert have these small box base points, which would sort of classically, you might call them uh, kind of a Meadowood style, but um, uh, these these harpoon end blades um, uh, from these Paleo Indian site or Paleo Inu Inuit sites are are interesting because it's uh, at the same places where you're finding um, these Washington Oak Chert sort of box base points that are kind of a local take on maybe a broader Northeast manifestation. Um, you have uh, Labrador uh, uh, Ramachurk coming into the same region. And so it suggests that maybe these Washington Oak points are, are uh, influenced. You can't tell whether or not they're being influenced from the Northeast or from groups to the South and West basically. And so it's kind of this interesting, like, you know, it's clearly kind of participating in something bigger um, uh, using kind of a local material, but it's it's not clear really which direction maybe groups are 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 uh, most heavily influenced or or are we're interacting with most frequently. That actually also speaks kind of more broadly to something that that I'm curious if you have any thoughts about. But the it seems like from the archaic to the woodland period, there's this transition from really liking rhyolites, kind yeah. of uh, stone tool, to liking cherts and. Maybe you could tell the listener what a rhyolite and what a chert are, and yeah. uh, and and then speak to that a little bit. So uh, so rhyolites are basically a volcanic. Um, I'm going to say this wrong. I think it's an extrusive rock. Um, uh, basically, it's a it's a rock that it's a volcanic rock that derives from volcanic activity. Um, tends to have um, come into. Uh, you can have um, felsic rhyolites, which are light colored stone, and then you have mafic uh, volcanic rocks, which are dark colored stone. Um, and then cherts are a sedimentary rock that basically forms um, in generally what are like limestone beds um, in lacustrine conditions. So basically a slurry of silica rich water um, permeates into a, um, a kind of a cavity in the limestone and hardens into um, what end up being actually very beautiful rocks um, uh, in a variety of different colors and uh, translucencies. Um, and so there's actually, so we had talked actually about at the transition from the Paleo into the Archaic period, how there's sort of this shift in um, lithic material preferences among Paleo Indians seem to like brightly colored materials, and then Archaic groups seem to like these duller colored, kind of uh, coarser grained, harder, heavier rocks. Um, and what we see in this in this transitional period between the transition Archaic and the and into the early woodland is a shift back to a preference for um, predominantly cherts um, and brightly colored materials, so finer grained. Um, brightly colored materials, which become increasingly more sought after over time throughout the maritime woodland. And we'll talk about this in, in the context in a few weeks about the late maritime woodland and, and how much people really like these brightly colored shirts. Um, but uh, uh, oh, the listener uh, can't see. Ken actually just, um, he, he looked, he got those sort of golem eyes there. And uh, it was, it was <laughs> it's really disconcerting. How much um, do they like them, Ken? Uh, 
a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, but we don't we can't actually we don't really have a good way to explain why this happens. Um, you know, both uh, Adrian Burke and David Black have written about this, um, among others. Um, and and you know, that's it's this sort of idiosyncratic behavior that we see in the archaeological record that we can't quite describe, um, but is sort of continuously reinforced through patterning across the region, you know, that there's this shift at around 9,000 years ago away from brightly colored materials, and then a shift again around 3,000 years ago back to a preference for them. And so um, in some cases, it may have to do with accessibility of some of these sources. So uh, I, I'll use the Washtenaw Lake example. The lake was probably the lake, the source on the lake was probably not accessible before about 3,800 years ago, um, um, just because of local water levels. Uh, but places like Munsungan in northern Maine um, would have been exposed all throughout the pre-contact history. Um, and for a, a period of time, groups ceased uh, getting their stone there. And, and uh, why? Um, some of it might have to do with technology. So, you know, there's a de-emphasis on groundstone material once you enter the maritime woodland period to sort of more of a preference on flake stone technologies that had started in the earlier transitional archaic. But, um, uh, uh, you know, all of these things kind of we, we can think about various different reasons why people may be doing this. We talked about the birch bark canoe becoming, so, you know, vessel technology may be shifting in the transitional archaic. And so you see a perpetuation maybe of, of uh, um, you know, watercraft in the early woodland, which is maybe why stuff is moving around so quickly. Um, but we don't have any real concrete answers on that. And, and so this is one of these things that I think we'll continue to kind of puzzle through. Um, you know, uh, Dave Black has kind of speculated that um, Tobic rhyolite, which is a a red, um, sort of a red, black colored rhyolite. Um, Not to be confused with Tobic chert, which is a red, black colored chert. Well, yeah. So, so, and with, <laughs> and they co-occur. So there are cherty blebs in the in the rhyolite sometimes. Um, and so the, the the rhyolite you see on a number of sites that date to kind of transitional archaic early woodland, um, like the Dead Man's Pool site on the Tobic River, for example, is a good example. Um, David Sanger wrote an article about it in 1971. Um, and, uh, uh, David has speculated that maybe this is kind of a transitional material and that it sort of has these brighter, um, uh, more, more striking colors in it, but it's still a rhyolitic. Uh, so the, the stone is very, the material is very similar to what had been used for years, but the color is starting to look more like what, um, what you might adopt in the, in the maritime woodland. So, yeah. um, you know, that's a, that's a, you know, a four or five minute explanation that is, uh, well, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Tune in to episode 1003 of the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast to hear more. <laughs> um, so, so Ken, um, before we get further uh, down these bottles of Covassier, should we should we maybe go through some specific some specific New Brunswick sites that the listener might be interested in? Yeah, yeah, I think that'd be because uh, we do actually have some very interesting early woodland stuff in New Brunswick that I think is yeah. definitely worth highlighting. So the the Augustine Mound is kind of an obvious place to start here. Yeah, I think so. Um, so and, you want to take that one? Well, I'll, I'll how about I'll start it and then you you hop in at some point right. as, if if you if you think it needs it. So so essentially, in the 1970s, Chris Turnbull, provincial archaeologist from New Brunswick, uh, enters into a collaborative project with the Metapanagia First Nation because uh, he was approached and folks living at Metapanagia said. We know about this place where the, I believe the quote was where the ancestors used to dance, right? That's correct. And so it's this, it's this mound, and it uh, archaeologists today virtually never excavate, at least certainly intentionally excavate um, indigenous human burials. If they were to do so, you, it would be in collaboration with indigenous communities. But this is a really kind of early collaborative project, important collaborative project of this. Um, Adina or Middlesex Burial Man. And what this really did, and I think the the title of Turnbull's article about this kind of hints, you know, says this, right? It's a mound for the Maritimes. So all of a sudden, this uh, New Brunswick is now clearly part in the archaeological narrative of these broader um, kinds of burial ceremonialism we talked about. And uh, I think the phrase Sue usually, Sue Blair usually uses is it's a Dina with boots on, right? So it's got <laughs> yeah. all of these, these are, or with bells on, boots on? I'm not sure. I, I think it's got boots on, yeah. Boots on, yeah, yeah. The, um, it's, uh, but the site does have bells. It's got copper tinkling cones, I think, right? Uh, 
and yeah some at least a close approximation to what you would call yeah yeah it's got um an enormous and it's got really incredible preservation we've talked about that um under most conditions organic materials don't preserve uh in the maritimes but one of the ways one of the th reasons they will preserve is if they're from if there are copper salts so there's an enormous number of beads made from native copper um which the the, the just as an aside the there are all sorts of local there's local copper. People sometimes talk about copper coming in from the Great Lakes. And I'm just going to point out that even Champlain mentioned that there were local copper. So <laughs> I don't entirely understand this. But this is rather than being smelted copper. These are sheets of copper, which can be hammered into uh, into beads or, or other shapes. As they break down, they release salts, which sort of poison the little things in the soil that'll, that'll break down organics. There's stone material from the Midwest. There are artifact forms that are uh, really, really uh, ceremonial rather than being than being utilitarian. So, for instance, yeah. blocked in tubular pipes. Um, the, I'm sure no one in our audience has ever smoked anything, um, but you really need both ends <laughs> if you're going to smoke something. In in uh, from what I've seen on TV, and uh, there are uh, and, and it's, this mound was excavated and had of course has human burials in it. And fit and has since fit into a, a broader understanding of what's used to be called, but I don't think anyone calls it anymore the Boucher complex. This, the, which was one of those phrases to describe the northern version of Adena metal sex, based on uh, a site in Vermont. Another interesting thing about this site was that, like at Boucher, um, Augustine Mound is kind of parallel, it's, it's on a riverine environment and it's paralleled with a nearby, parallel is probably the wrong word, but sort of across from a habitation site in a very similar ecological setting to what we see at sites like Boucher and other such early woodland sites. In the Maritimes, yeah. we, we know we have other ones of these too. I mean, we don't necessarily have the habitation sites, but we know that there's sites like Scora in Nova Scotia, which are these early woodland um, uh, burial mounds. Yeah, yeah, and there's certainly objects. So, like, there's a private collector, for example, that I've uh, uh, worked with in the Lower St. John River, Lower Wolastog region, and there's artifacts in her collection, for example, that are made on material from Ontario that are sort of that classic Adena style um, kind of fall, and you know, on a, on an exotic material. There's a hypertrophic biface, which is a very large um, uh, biface. Um, made in a particular type uh, style that that you only see associated with these like Adena Middlesex um, or or you tend to see with these Adena Middlesex, Middlesex um, uh, manifestations. Um, we'll drop this in the show notes, but uh, Sue Blair and Mike Rooney just uh, had some had a chapter out about uh, some of these early woodland manifestations uh, at Metapanagia, which is a really yeah, good chapter. And yeah, and they and they kind of uh, look at the whole landscape and the number of sites around there as sort of this site complex, and and that there's sort of these episodes of occupation of the of the area in around Metapanagiag, and 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 in particular that the mound itself had sort of two construction episodes. There's sort of an earlier one between probably 2700 and 2300 years ago, and then a later one probably around 2300 to 1000 years ago, um, with indications that, that that for example the mound terrace actually had probably had some mortuary activity going on um, much earlier. Um, so, so Chris Turnbull had speculated that an early date that they got 2950 BP um, from one of the features near the middle of the mound, near the base of it, um, was probably uh, a, a pre-mound feature um, and, and that there was something going on there that even, that would put it very early on in what, in this sort of, um, this burial ceremonial period, basically, um, which, which speaks to what we had talked about earlier, where like these things all seem to overlap in, in ways that suggest that, you know, something big was happening um, and, and that it was happening very quickly, uh, you know, at the scale of hundreds, hundreds of years, as opposed to, you know, uh, thousands, so. And the habitation site near there is the Oxbow site. And do you want to yep. take the Oxbow site? Uh, yeah. Ken and I, mean, I are going to play musical chairs. This is, this is we're going to play musical chairs at the sites <laughs> until someone can't figure it, can't remember what the site is. They, yeah. uh, because I'm, I'm realizing as I look at this list that we've done a very, very risky thing here, which is list the sites, but with almost no notes. With almost no notes. Yeah. So, yeah, so, uh, um, so... we are, we're flying blind here, listener. And uh, I can, yeah, the, the, 
Wesley and uh, and uh, and 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 Wesley's colleagues, I, I suspect, are, are checking to be ready with the with the erratum button, or the, it might yeah, be. Yeah, we, we haven't we haven't been had a chance to play that music for a few weeks, so that's. Uh, we probably um, had a so, chance. We just haven't. We just haven't done it. <laughs> so so Oxbow um, was excavated uh, shortly after Augustine Mound. I think it was in 1978, um, uh, and was the topic of. Um, uh, Patricia Allen, who was the provincial archaeologist following Chris Turnbull up until sometime in the late 90s, I think, um, was when she retired um, and worked as a consultant actually afterwards. Um, and uh, so Pat did her um, her master's thesis on uh, Oxbow, which is this very, very deeply stratified archaeological site. And so when we, we talk about deeply stratified, we're talking about um, there were successive layers of occupation um, very well um, uh, uh, very well intact um, and what they these were sort of basically occupational episodes where people were living at the Oxbow site um, uh, intermixed with sort of like flood events and so there'd be sediment in between these layers and, and uh, these these very deep large excavation um, uh, pits are, are really great to see photos of because um, you can actually see sort of like history um, uh, in, a, in a profile and, and you can see sort of these, uh, um, you know, series of, of occupational events and natural events kind of co um, sort of following each other through time. Um, and the, the earliest stuff at Oxbow, so when they got to the base of the excavation, they actually started to hit the water table. And so they were recovering artifacts near the base of their excavation units that hinted at transitional archaic material and so there's some projectile points that look very reminiscent to um, some of these broader narrow points that we talked about last week um, uh, made on local materials so on quartz which is very which is kind of predominant in that area um, but the earliest dates from uh, oxbow are to uh, 20 2980 um, and uh, so you know you're talking about at least um, and, and I think the latest dates are up until about 1400 years ago, um, if I'm not mistaken. Don't remember. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, don't quote me We're not me afraid on that, to say we don't know, listener. Yeah. But there were a series of um, uh, well-documented occupational horizons, um, uh, Pat Allen's um, projectile point sequence and ceramic sequence from there has been sort of instrumental for building chronological narratives from um, uh, New Brunswick. It was used as sort of an internal example before some of the stuff that go, went on in the lower Wolostog, and it's now a very useful comparative to places like the Quadi region um, and the lower Wolostog at places like Jemsay Crossing um, as a way to kind of understand um, different human spaces through time. Um, and, and so Oxbow is um, a habitation site. There's um, looking across the river at, uh, um, at the Augustine Mound, um, but in the same area you have other um, uh, uh, ritual or ceremonial sites like Tozer, for example, uh, and then some habitation sites like Howe, Hogan Mullen, and Wilson, um, um, all of which uh, are less Adena related and look to be more Meadowood related. And so they have these kind of diagnostic um, uh, side notch projectile points and, and triangular, very thin um, uh, uh, projectile points um, and, and some other objects that kind of tie them in with this broader, again, sort of uh, broader northeast manifestations all kind of going on in this very localized area around basically where the little southwest and the southwest Miramichi meet I think is the confluence of those two rivers and, and it, I think one of the things that I find really interesting about that work too is the all the sorts of continuities that you see um, from that landscape right up to the present right you know of course, yeah. it's Metapanagia now, but but some of the work that um, I think Jesse Webb in particular was doing on sturgeon um, out there, you know, and there's there's sturgeon in the the mouth, sturgeon remains in the basically sturgeon have armor, and there's remains of the armor um, of sturgeons in things like the mound fill at Augustine Mound, and then you read the ethnohistoric accounts, and folks are are painting sturgeons on their canoes, you know, so yeah. you get these these remarkable kind of continuities through time, which are which are really amazing. And there, and there are features that date to late, much later than the mound itself, I think to about 1500 years ago, that look to be possibly um, pits, basically, um, uh, that were, were sort of uh, functioned as maybe like sturgeon cooking pits or smoking pits or something like that. So some kind of feasting ritual. Yeah. So. And while we're on the, the interior uh, and talking about ritual stuff, well, yeah, yeah well, I guess we'll, we, well, we probably should have talked about Muddle Extreme, but Muddle Extreme is an early woodland site. Um, 
I don't know what more there's to say about it. It was also a transitional archaic site, and it's got other woodland components too. And it and it's where the sort of the best known, um, sort of the, the only I guess dated uh, Venet one ceramics because it was the the Venet one ceramics from Mud Lake Stream are the ones that uh, that were associated with a radiocarbon date, whereas the stuff from like Gemsake, for example, uh, was found in the plow zone. Yeah, am I, am I correct there? That's my understanding. Yeah. I mean, everything it, I learned about that site, I learned from someone who approached us in a bar at a CAA, and then it was very strange. They were, they were wearing um, a, uh, you could tell they were an academic because they were, they were wearing a mask and they had a, a voice modulator on, but there was a, <laughs> they were wearing a tweed jacket and, uh, and, and they, they smelled like pipe smoke. So, it, so the whole thing is very mysterious. And then, and then they pulled up and they, and they cracked open a, uh, a briefcase and uh, it, there it was. It was right there beside their grail diary. Uh, which I which I thought was interesting, and uh, and then they handed us this um, this packet, which uh, and and we 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 squared it safely back. Um, which you know that 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 episode is a story for another day that that doesn't need to be on a podcast. Probably. <laughs> I, I uh, when I returned the the ceramics actually to the provincial um, heritage branch, uh, the gentleman who worked there at the time informed me that uh, uh, it would have been great to have these. Uh, uh, in house to to work on for my master's thesis years ago. <laughs> um, and just just a sidebar, I actually wanted to kind of backtrack uh, about rhyolite. I wanted to give a definition that's actually like a little bit less cagey. Um, and so I was correct. It is an extrusive igne igneous rock, um, and an extrusive rock is basically igneous rocks that form at the Earth's surface where lava erupts. And so it cools very quickly um, with little time for minerals to grow. So they're, the minerals in an extrusive rock are actually very small. Um, and so they, do, they um, uh, what we sometimes call affinitic, affinitic. So basically you can't see the grain structure as much. Um, uh, and so uh, this is as opposed to intrusive rocks like granite or something like that. And so rhyolites can come in a couple different varieties. So there's flow banded rhyolites, which are ones that show uh, distinctive banding um, um, with like quartz and that sort of stuff in them. Uh, and then peripheritic rhyolites, which um, uh, the, the magma starts to crystallize slowly um, and then erupts as lava and cools very quickly. And so there's phenocrysts, so small um, microscopic crystals um, that are kind of square shaped in there. And I, and I want to give a shout out to the... Um, the Nova Scotia Pebbles uh, 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 work um, uh, fact sheet from the uh, Atlantic Geoscience Society. Uh, this is actually a fantastic resource, um, and yeah. we will actually we'll, we should put it in the show, show notes because um, uh, it's actually just an excellent resource to have. Um, uh, yeah, all of their work really rocks. I find. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, the uh, it's it's the Nova Scotia Pebbles. Okay, so we will. Yeah, uh, we will... Atlantic Geoscience Society. It's the same group that published the last billion years. Um, oh, fantastic! Which is which is a book that Ken and uh, Dave Holyoke, or, sorry, Ken Holyoke and, and Dave Black uh, had a the, did a lot of I think did all the archaeology for. Uh, yeah, that we we updated the contributions for the archaeology yeah. in the most recent version. So yeah, yeah, it's a great book. And and um, actually, if we have any uh, listeners who. Uh, it, it's super suitable for kids too. It's a great book for, you know, the middle schooler in your life is interested in science and archaeology and those kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. And there's um, even, you know, it sort of talks about uh, like, uh, you know, dinosaurs on the East coast and, and uh, you know, where, where you might find these sort of fossils and, and uh, how, how the, how, where you are was formed basically um, from yeah. a geological perspective. So. Right. And then we've got um, the Bristol Shiktahawk cache. Yeah, which is uh, so. This is a really cool master's thesis by Alex Pelletier Michaud. Um, also, a very good master's thesis, I should say. Did did really did a lot of work on this. And Alex so Pelletier, for for those of you that don't know him, is probably the most fluently bilingual person in the sense that he is a poet in two languages, um, and uh, and can basically write music and and uh, uh, and talk more eloquently than either Gabriel. We should get him on the show here sometime just to kind of riff. We uh, should on 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 Cash Blades. Great. He's also a, a great fan of the band Ween, which uh, features heavily in in, in I think thesis. his worldview. Well, I don't yeah. know about the, the mention of the thesis. But certainly features yeah. into his worldview. Yeah. Um. And so anyway, cash, so yeah. <laughs> go ahead. No, go ahead. So the cache was originally excavated by George Frederick Clark, who we've talked about in previous episodes. So um, fairly famous avocational archaeologist. He's published um, uh, published a book on archaeology, Someone Before Us, which most recently had an updated version in 2016, um, released by... Chapel Street Editions, right? 
Yeah, there we go. Travel Street Editions. And uh, Dave Block. Great little publishing Dave... house out of uh, Woodstock. Yeah. And um, um, so Clark excavated the site, um, was well, had, had found stuff there, I think, since his childhood, basically, um, in the plowed fields and, and came across this cache. And a cache is basically a cluster of um, implements that you'll find in all in one place. They tend to be um, bifaces. So, um, you know, we've talked about bifaces before, objects that are made on both sides. And caches tend to be um, um, ritually charged um, and tend to be a lot of like materials. And so there are at least, excuse me, 37 bifaces found in this cache, um, many reminiscent of Midwest forms. Um, mm -hmm. And so you have uh, a number of, uh, most of them are bipointed, which means they kind of, they're almost leaf shaped. They look, um, what is it, a beech leaf, leaf that's usually bipointed like that? Um, so... Oh, interesting. I, I remember Alex thought that they um, they really invoke paddles. They evoke, yeah. well, they evoke leaves, but they also invoke paddles. Paddles. And, and like so the, blade, the blades of paddles. Yeah. And so interesting sort of um, style and form. Um, Alex sort of interprets that based on the um, similarity of a number of these, they kind of have uh, several of them, several sets have pairs. Um, in that they are morphologically and, and um, um, at least by material, almost identical. And so what it looks like is that there was either a person or a group of very closely related people who were making these uh, implements on site um, based on the n amount of debitage that was also found there. So the sort of the byproducts of making these stone tools, which is really fascinating because, um, like I said, many of these are made in forms that are reminiscent of um, broader northeastern um, and midwestern forms, so like the turkey tail point, for example, which is kind of a classic, like a sort of Ohio and West Great Lakes um, um, projectile point that you find in early woodland contexts. And um, the actual the lithic reduction, it's because it's not just that these points look alike, although they they do, they tend to have pairs that look very similar in this cache. They also, the actual lithic reduction sequence is almost, almost as if it was mechanized, you know, it's, yeah. it's they're, they're knocking off flakes in exactly the same way to produce these, these uh, bifaces that are in the cache. And should we talk about the coast for a minute? I guess we could uh, talk about the Weir site, which yeah. David Black worked at. It's got a, a deeply stratified uh, shell bearing site with uh, early woodland material at the bottom of it. There's um, along with that, there's work that Dave's been doing in general about transitional archaic sites from this, uh, from the Quadi region and which direction they tend to face. So we mentioned earlier, they just are in a different setting than we would associate with woodland sites. They tend to face uh, northward rather than um, southward. So we suspect, though, that many of these sites are, uh, especially on the coast, are eroding, right? Because we've talked about chronological shingling, where older sites tend to erode away first before more recent sites. What are we missing, Ken? And uh, and then just to kind of rehash, uh, in the lower Wolostog, you have uh, early maritime woodland stuff at Gemseg. You have it at, uh, at the Fulton Island site as well. Um, Gemseg, you know, in particular, uh, was studied in depth by Sue Blair. And what you can see is that there's an increase in, at least in the early part of the early maritime woodland, you have an increase in exotic materials. So you have stuff from um, coming from Southern Ontario, from um, parts of Maine, uh, uh, also from Labrador. Uh, and then you have, uh, you have a number of objects that are consistent with these sort of metawood forms. Um, uh, a fr Vinette One pottery, a gorget, a fragment of a blocked end tubular pipe. Bifacial bi scrapers, which are another thing kind of reminiscent of, of uh, metalwood forms, uh, and you have and you have uh, uh, dates that basically position the site as sort of continuously occupied from the transitional archaic um, right up until the uh, just before the late maritime woodland. Um, same as at Fulton Island, um, where there there is a, a sort of visible early woodland component, um, at least based on the stone tools. There's no vignette one pottery from Fulton Island to, to my recollection, but but basically you're seeing um, as, as with other places like, like the Weir site, for example, where you're seeing sort of these continuously occupied places that we're going to actually come back to several times as we're talking about, uh, the maritime woodland more generally, because these places, uh, appear to have been, uh, sort of continuously occupied for, uh, millennia, um, uh, right through the maritime woodland, uh, from the transitional archaic, right through the maritime woodland. Um, and, uh, but yeah, that's, uh, um, uh, that's all the notes I have 
uh, all, all of the vaguely noted uh, uh, archaeological sites from the early woodland. I'm sure we missed some, but uh... oh, I'm sure we did. The uh, but but we we want to give the listener a chance to a chance to, to chime in and and have that that thrill of. Uh, I hope we didn't miss anyone's favorite early woodland site. That's what you really feel bad about. Yeah, that's true. That's that's where the guilt is. Um, but uh, but Ken, uh, what helps to assuage that guilt is that I think we might each be getting close to a half finished bottle of Cuvassier, which might mean it's time for our hit pieces. I think it might be. So I am, oh, my link didn't work there. There we go. Um, so uh, you, some of you may have actually seen uh, on the media, this was actually well reported, which was fantastic. Um, uh, a group of archeologists um, and members of the North Carolina American Indian Heritage Commission um, and the North Carolina Office uh, of the, uh, the State Office of Archeology span um, recovered uh, uh, a thousand year old canoe from uh, Lake Wakama in uh, North Carolina last week. Um, and really fascinating because what it looks like is it's about, it's almost nine meters long, uh, made from pine, uh, pretty much fully intact and remarkably well pres preserved. And this is uh, kind of a classic example of what we would call a dugout canoe. Um, and it looks like it was probably uh, built by hollowing it out, um, hollowing it a, a whole tree log, um, probably burned um, first and then kind of chiseled out. Uh, apparently there's burn marks in the grains of the wood. Um, and uh, uh, it was originally found by three teenagers who um, uh, happened upon it in 2021 and, uh, and, and very um, responsibly of themselves, uh, basically stored it under a pier and then contacted the state archeology span office. And so um, really great kind of, uh, um, really great story about preservation of something fascinating and unique um but also a really great uh uh communication of of sort of the 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 no north carolina state archaeology office must be very happy that uh, you know that this uh, group of people thought to give them a call and and recognize this as something truly unique that uh, that you know should be preserved and and uh, and shared with other people so um as That's always great. we would oh go ahead so I was going to say that that's a real testament both to the kids involved, but I suspect also probably to the North Carolina Archaeology Office, who's clearly been doing some outreach to folks about what to do in these situations. Yeah, yeah. And so and so we would always encourage you, obviously, if you find something um, that's eroding or you are uh, uh, concerned about um, uh, maybe uh, a resource that you're aware of that you think might be threatened uh, to reach out to um, the Provincial Archaeology Office um, uh, in, in New Brunswick. It's called the Archaeology and Heritage Branch. Um, and uh, and report finds um, and uh, and kind of understand what your responsibilities and your rights are when it comes to archaeology. But know that um, speaking to, to an archaeologist and, and getting some context for what it is you're finding uh, is really important because uh, um, there are very few of us working in this region, um, and uh, and we rely on the public actually for a lot of um, um, understanding the past. So very true. Um... So my hit piece this week is a self-serving hit piece. Arthur Anderson uh, and I uh, just sat out in the most recent Maine Archaeological Society bulletin, uh, a paper in which we wrote up a collection from the Robert S. Peabody Institute. Um, uh, we may have talked about it before, but Ted Stoddard, uh, working on his dissertation at Harvard in the 1950s, did some uh, really actually kind of excellent cutting edge modern work in the mostly in the main side of the Quadi region, some in New Brunswick, some in Nova Scotia. And, uh, but due to a variety of events, uh, didn't end up finishing the dissertation. So those collections and notes are at the Robert S. Peabody Institute. And Arthur and I have been slowly working our way through them, wrote one up, and that's the one from Denbell Point. Um, but it also includes some information just about uh, what kind of collecting folks were doing in Down East Maine. So we talk a little bit about the 20th century collecting a vocational archaeology tradition uh, down east in that article. And uh, I think we also have another hit piece, which is a, 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 a looking ahead hit piece, which is that Ken and I are both going to be at the CAA meeting in member two. And yeah. 
while we're there, we're going to be co-chairing papers in honor of David W. Black. And so we're doing um, a session in which a bunch of us are giving papers, and those papers are in honor of Dave Black's long and illustrious career in the region. And so we're very excited to celebrate Dave, uh, and we're, we're looking forward to that. In addition, Ken is involved in a CAA panel at this that I understand, even if you're not a CAA member, can you, can you tune into? Yeah, and actually, maybe we will link the, um, if you, you're interested, uh, basically, this is going to be a panel discussion with um, uh, some folks from the CRM industry and other aspects of the heritage industry, um, and we'll be presenting it as a webinar. Um, so this is going to be part of what we hope to be moving forward, um, kind of a professionalization um, and outreach um, series that put on by the CAA. Uh, and so even if you are not a member or not planning on attending the conference, you are able to register for this Zoom webinar um, and get an opportunity to hear from the panel and uh, ask some questions about uh, basically how they got into um, archaeology or the heritage related field that they're in um, and ask questions, you know, maybe advice on, on uh, how, what kind of education they need, they sh you should get. Um, it's aimed at, uh, you know, undergraduates or graduate students um, or just interested public and, and members of uh, various communities if you are interested in pursuing a career in the heritage field more generally. Um, and so, yeah, I think let's, let's throw the, uh, the webinar registration link in the, in the show notes. That sounds great. Yeah, we will, we will put that in the show notes. Um, and also, since Ken and I will be at the CA, we would love to meet um, our listeners. So uh, we have acquired a new batch of stickers. So uh, if you're a listener, um, Ken and I uh, are, are, we're going to completely stand out from the other archaeologists at this conference. We're going to be, uh, we're both short. We have glasses, we have beards, we often wear plaid. And, uh, and uh, we will probably be wearing essentially matching sports coats. So we're going to look like everybody else uh, at this conference, uh, all the, all the, the two thirds of the men anyway. Um, and, but we would encourage you to, uh, you know, kind of ominously grab everyone's name tag and look really close at it and then look disappointed if you discover it's not Ken or me and then say you're looking for the, the men with the stickers. On, and on uh, Friday afternoon, we may be distinguishable by our sharp denim Unif uh, denim suits. That's right. We're Canadian tuxedos on on Friday, right? I think that's Friday. I think it's Friday. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Although I'm hoping there's a small army of us in in Canadian <laughs> tuxedos. <laughs> so, well, Ken, do we have anything else for the listener uh, tonight, other than that uh, exciting opportunity potentially to uh, get stickers? I don't think so. I think uh, I think we will speak to the listener again uh in three weeks on on uh the middle woodland i guess um, yes middle woodland is next but we'll talk to them before that about about the caa even if we don't about see the CA and uh get an opportunity to hear um from some experts in the region and peers and friends and and hear what everybody is working on and presenting on at the conference so um like the portlandia episode i think this should be really great to get a sense of just uh you know, the broad scope of archaeology research that's going on in this and adjacent areas, which is which is really fun to hear. Well, thank you very much, as always, for tuning in. This has been the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast, and we will see you next week, approximately. Thank you, listener. Take care, everyone.